Well, welcome back to another Rest, Eat, Move podcast. Um, last week, you heard a recap on blood pressure, which I think is a fascinating podcast. Sometimes when I re-listen to something that was in the past, I forget, man, that's some good information. Did you like that last podcast? Well, it's not what we always like, but the feedback's been, hey, really like that last podcast. So, yeah, it res- it's resonated with a lot of people. But, yeah, I, I was listening to it. I'm thinking, okay. I'm getting a lot of questions about it. We're doing lots of, you know, consultations. Okay, let's put that back out there. So today we're going to talk about weight loss um, and a couple of reasons why. I think we're talking about weight loss today in um, February, which seems like we're in the middle of the summertime. It's 70 degrees today. But weight loss is so interesting right now, you know, with all the drugs we've talked about, which if you want to re-listen to some of the conversations we've had on Ozempic and some other medications, I think we're falling into this comfortability of of what we're comfortable with from a weight. I think we're falling into this comfortability of it's normal to take a medication for weight loss. I think we're falling into this comfortability that our our children should be overweight because it's normal. And and so today we're gonna we're gonna talk about weight loss, maybe the X's and O's of weight loss what's going on, but it's going to encompass a lot of things. So this was your idea. When you think of weight loss, just give me what your brain thinks when you hear weight loss. Well, the big challenge for many people every day, I mean, you look at our country, this is these diabetes weight loss drugs are going to break a hundred billion. So we have a major problem. We have a major problem, and we're really not addressing the source of the problem, and then we're not really going after the solution of the problem. So we're masking it like anything else. Like if I have acid reflux or a headache, I'm taking certain meds. Let me pa- let me pause you right there. So you just said major problem. Is it more of a major symptom? It's a symptom. But we're, we're kind of addressing it as a genetic problem mm-hmm. disorder. Keep going. It's definitely a symptom. And so it's a symptom of a fast-moving lifestyle, you know, no time, lack of movement, stress has never been higher, we don't sleep anymore. These, these are all factors. That's the hard part about it is getting your arms wrapped around it. Just because you have taking a medication that allows you to lose weight, you're still not fixing the source of the problem. So it's going to show up in other areas. Medication you have to take your entire life. It's going to cost you anywhere between, you know, Fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year, so it's going to break the bank. It already's going to. It's doing it right now. So th- I kept thinking, you know, at this stage in my career, I'm going to turn sixty-seven in the fall. I was talking to different people, and they're like, "Why don't you come up with a weight loss book?" Well, I go, well, "I got this amazing rest eat move book that took me two and a half years to write. It's kind of in there." They said, "No, condense it. Bring out the highlights. What do you really want to talk about?" If you were sitting down with somebody, and you were helping them lose weight, what would you tell them? And so that's really why I felt like this is a good time. You know, it's the end of February. Many people want to get, maybe lose a couple pounds for the summer or whatever it might be. But let's really address some of these key points. And then I'm reading a book that for those of you out there, it's called Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. And the whole book's based, it's a great book, so if you want to try something that's interesting. and But he talks about going in the Yukon for 33 days. You can't take a Uber, you can't, you know, get, you know, Uber Eats or whatever. You, it's just, you're there. So you're going to be uncomfortable. When I've competed in bodybuilding, people ask me all the time, are you hungry? Uh, I'm kind of uncomfortable. I wouldn't say I'm hungry or starving or my glucose level's too low. I feel great but I ride the level of being a little uncomfortable. And I think that's what we're struggling with today is we don't want to be uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable is actually a great thing. And that's what the whole book's about, Comfort Crisis, is that the more we do things that are hard sometimes, it's not going to you know, damage us or hurt us. That makes us you know, grow and uh, become alive and all the stuff that comes with it. So that, that was my thought process behind this reading this book and really kind of saying, okay, why are we so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable? Yeah, before you said that, I wrote down fast-paced lifestyle, so we want everything. 
but we want to do it as easy as possible, which I think breeds disaster. So if you're, if you have high amount of stress, but you're uncomfortable getting uncomfortable, <laughs> things are going to break. Well, I, th I think you know this, you know, our place up in northern Michigan at Douglas Lake, we were up there last week with some really close friends of ours. But if you walked out there, I walked out in the middle of the lake with my dog Floyd, and you can't hear anything. It's completely, and so, and I'll say that to, you know, mom sometimes, I'll say, listen, it's, you can't hear anything. There's no, there's no noise. We're, we're, so it's all that stuff that we're not, we've become desensitized to that stillness, that quietness. And so this all creeps up on us. I, I had a gentleman I was just coaching uh, before we started the podcast. And he drove, he drives in from Kalamazoo, but he was talking about a scale and he was at the store looking at for scales. And back in the day, you'd have a scale that would not go up to 250 pounds and then it would stop. It wouldn't go any higher until you were less than 250. Now you have scales at 300. And then he was just amazed. There was 10 scales on the shelf that for 400 pounds, and there was 10 scales for 500 pounds. I mean, is that where we've gone? So I think that's, these are all the things that have become a symptom of being like, we're just too comfortable. Like, hey, let's, and we all know, you know this. I mean, when you played college golf and you struggled for a while, and then maybe you came back and started you know, I got it again. That's the beauty. I mean, if it's always good, it's always sunny and sun's always shining. But it's sometimes when we get in the mud, we look back, that's the best stuff. So I think that's, that's what I want to talk about today is like, let's get uncomfortable. Th there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you look back and you're like, and people say, you've always said to me, <laughs> you know, the reason you competed in bodybuilding wasn't getting a sword or a tr trophy. It was going through the mud. And then I look back, I'm like, wow, my taste changed, my digestion changed, my energy. It's all that stuff that you go through and uh, the process of being uncomfortable. All right, so from a weight loss, we'll talk about diets, we'll talk about exercise, um, surgeries, prescriptions, supplements, things like cold plunges and trends, um, hormones, anything I'm missing on that sheet that's relevant well right you know and then again we can talk about dieting diets all work until they don't you know people say all the time and i've said this before diets don't work well diets do work until they don't and usually most diets only last about five days sounds so, like a good plan so that's the challenge is like okay so this diet works until it doesn't and if you look back you know i, I wrote in my last book rest eat move but you know in 1820 lord byram was talking about apple cider vinegar. That was in 1820s and nothing new. In 1920s, it was a lucky strike diet. This is craziness. That they, they recommended you smoke cigarettes to control your weight. <laughs> in fact, Grammy used to always say that I can't quit smoking because I'm going to gain weight. And then <laughs> she quit smoking and she didn't gain weight. So, <coughs> and then if you just f jump forward again, there's, you know, there was the diet where you sprinkled on. A, um, where you sprinkled the powder on the food that you don't digest, and that was in the 80s. That wasn't that long ago. Sounds good. And then you had the, you know, the whole protein craze, and then the fat craze, which is today. I mean, it doesn't end. So it works until well, it here's doesn't. here's one for you. 1960s Weight Watchers made its debut with the point system. 2024 Weight Watchers owns a portion of Ozempic. So yeah, better look I mean, out. I mean, come on, everybody. Let's just. So again, that's. The, it, we're, we're repeating, we're repeating the history. And so why do we, again, it goes back to comfort. I, how many times have you seen a commercial? You can eat anything and you don't have to sweat to lose weight. Yeah. Well, wh wh why is that so appealing to people? Like, why is that appealing to, I don't have to sweat and I don't, I can eat anything I want. I can eat the, all of the lasagna I want, but I'm still going to lose weight. How is that going to work? Well, I wrote down a couple of things. When I think of weight loss, I think, again, I, I try to get into the mind of what people want. Obviously, there's physical appearance. There's uh, self-esteem. But I, th I really think what we overlook is capacity to function. So it can't go up, down, 
up and down the stairs as well. I can't bend over. I can't be active. I don't do the things I used to do. I can't fit in my clothes. Um, but I think we forget about like fitness, you know, what's your fitness level. And those are the things that I, I really truly think people should pay attention to the most because if all you look are looking for is the look, Ozempic's going to win every time. If, well, I, if what you're truly though looking for is to be healthier, this, none of this stuff would ever make any sense. And so a number one question that you said is, what do you want? And I think this is where, as we start this weight loss conversation today, if you're saying, I want to lose weight, we all have clients that want to come in and they want to lose weight. I think there's one question we should ask. What do you want? Do you want to be healthy or you just want the scale to have a, a lower number? I think right there, the fork in the road, that will kind of put people in a couple buckets. I still see people that come in and it's all about the number. I don't think we can help them the same way. I don't think they're going to do it with the way where they're going to get uncomfortable. And when they get uncomfortable, they're just going to go to the next thing. Not saying that they're a bad person, not saying that they shouldn't keep trying, but I think that's where the fork in the road. Do you want to be healthy or do you just want the number to say something? And that's why Ozempic's going crazy is because all people want is to fit in the clothes, to say I'm a certain pant size or waist size or dress size, or they take a picture and they feel good about themselves. Um, or do you truly want to have longevity and health? And, and those two things I think are completely different. And I think you can have both. I mean, the, again, we talked about this. This is a symptom. So if you're only f focused on the scale – you can dehydrate yourself. You can do a high protein diet, the cabbage soup diet, the egg diet. You can make your body acidic. You can flush water. You know, each carbohydrate oh, holds four moles of water. So again, it's easy. I mean, when we com used to bodybuilding, they used to cut carbs. You know, carb deplete. I'm like, well, why would I do that and get unhealthy just so I look good for about you know two hours on stage? So we, you get all that. But like what you're saying is. The scale or whatever, I think we all need monitoring. You need some type of measurement. We can talk about that. But what's your process? I mean, if you can hang from a bar for 10 seconds, 30 seconds for a minute, that tells you right away that I have the grip strength. But if you're weighing X weight that you're o way overweight, that's going to be very difficult. Or learning how to do a push-up or maybe even a pull-up or whatever it might be. These are all performance metrics on top of just the scale. Well, you, you and you and Walt like to say form follows function or uh, f function follows form, vice versa sometimes. But if you can hang from a bar, you're probably going to lose weight. If you can hang from a bar or you can do pull-ups or you can do whatever it might be, like I always say to my clients, if you can do this these movements when you're 90, you will look like you can do these movements. Okay, so then here's the other thing. A lot of the Ozempic doctors that I think are coming at it from – maybe some positive angles, but most of them not a good angle. Talk about how the risk of being obese is what they're scared of, H high blood pressure, cholesterol, and all these things. If you get your blood pressure in order, if you get your cholesterol balanced, if you start to have a resting heart rate that's a certain number, if you're only breathing less than 10 breaths per minute, you, you, the symptom of weight will start to shape and shift. It doesn't go first. I think it's like the f who's on first, who's on second. We only start to pay attention for the most part. I would s let's just say 90% of the society pays attention only when the weight gets to a certain level because they're not even exposed to the function and the capacity and the fitness and the numbers. So well, weight to me is not as big of the problem. It's the symptom of not being healthy. And that's why if you ask the question, are you trying to be healthy or are you trying to just lose weight? If you, Losing weight is easy, and I don't mean that to seem like it, everyone out there should be at a, the best weight they should be in. I'm saying being healthy actually takes some effort. Well, and again, it, it's not going to happen overnight, so now we're into a process. That's the key. And it, all the process begins with self-awareness. The scale it could be self-awareness. Do you have the courage to measure? Do I have the courage to get on the scale? Do I have the courage to hang from a bar? Do I have the courage to get on the floor? But you have to have that self-awareness. If you don't have that self-awareness, you don't even know. Like, I'll bring people in, and I'll say, okay, I want you to get up on that bar, and I want you to hang from it. They can't. That hits them right in, like, the forehead. Now, they can lose weight, 
but I remember back in the day I worked with this guy, um, and he comes in, he was so proud of himself and went on this crash diet. And I knew how he did it. You know, he's just eating only protein, and he was just d depleting himself and, you know, taking amphetamines, and the, the list goes <laughs> on and on. So then I said to him, so back in the day, we did an assisted pull-up, and you could put 18 plates on. 18 would give you a much more easy way to do a pull-up, so a sure. lot of weight. And I said, you could do 10 repetitions. And this is, I haven't seen him in months. He couldn't do one repetition. But he lost a bunch of weight. he lost weight. He had no strength. He had no energy, whatever. But in his mind, he was so happy with himself. In reality, is he completely lost his health. So I think that's where it begins. Like, let's have some measurements, metrics. And it could be around losing weight. But that metric is just a sidebar. Like, when I was competing, I never cared about how much I weighed. I could care less. It was that I just followed the process. And I just kept following the process. And the same thing goes today. Yeah, I have an idea where I want to weigh. I weigh myself once a week. But that's just part of the equation. You know, well, how am I sleeping? What kind of fitness level I am at? So, so we want to talk about weight loss today. But reality is, is there's other factors that we look at. I mean, you want your body to work for you. If your hormones are not right, if your stress levels are high, cortisol levels are high, then growth hormone testosterone will be off. If we don't understand leptin and ghrelin, that's another conversation, understand dopamine. So I think we're not addressing enough of these awareness pieces that people don't quite understand to help them pursue what they want. But I like what you said at the very beginning is what do you want? Let's go from there. All right. So people, people want to, uh, let's just say they want to be healthy. They want to lose weight. Let's bundle those in together to, to, to start. Um, you were talking about reward hunger versus actual hunger. What does that mean? So, again, I'll use that book. I, it was, I've never heard it this way before, but in Comfort Crisis, he talks about real hunger, real hunger, where we get hunger pains, we get irritability. We've all been there before. When I was listening to that you know, podcast when they're out at sea, that's real hunger. I mean, they don't have any food. They're using rainwater. They're catching fish on a, you know, a, a little type of uh, bobby pin or whatever they were using, craziness, and they were catching fish. That's real hunger, and we've all been through that. But reward hunger is— Or maybe we haven't. Or maybe we haven't. Or maybe we haven't. And so that, to me, is— I've never had to catch fish for my— I had, Can you imagine that? I'm up in the Yukon. I have no food. I'm, I haven't had food in four days. I mean, that's real hunger. Um, you know, I'll do a wheatgrass fast for an entire day where I'm doing wheatgrass, spirulina, corella, but that's all I'm doing. That's real hunger. By From the comforts hours of later, your home. Yeah, 36 hours later. I mean, I got those mangoes there, and I got my oatmeal, and I have all that stuff in the refrigerator. But it's a real exercise. And, again, I really like that because, again, it's challenging me to get into that, you know, that that uncomfortable state. So, so that's the difference between reward hunger – when we have reward hunger, that's called dopamine. And that's why we look at our phones. That, I just eat that, and you know, and especially certain foods that spike your glycemic index. That, that's going to even So cr dopamine hunger could be a, m a lot of different things. It could be why you're like, I'll never be able to give up Diet Coke. Or it could be like, I ne never will not be able to eat pizza. That's, that's, that's not you saying that you can't. It's you saying that dopamine is pretty powerful. Well, and part of this is, and again, I've had a few clients lately, but we have to talk a little bit about skill sets. Like, if you put all this stuff around me, you know, it might be engaging, whatever. I, I don't really care about that. But if everything p is put in front of me and I got to get it, why is that? So that's where we, that's now a skill set that I don't really need that. In fact, I don't really want that. So that's real. That takes time. It takes time. That takes time to develop. Both ways. So if you develop that habit of dopamine every time to reward yourself, like my kids are young and everything is a treat day as a reward. It's, it's conditioned into us. You go into corporate America, it's a treat day. It's a reward. Who's bringing in the cake or the celebration? I mean, birthdays are very important. I love my birthday, but there's going to be a lot of birthdays to celebrate in a big office. And again, it never ends. It's, 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 
you know, it's this celebration, this celebration, it never ends. So at the time, you have to start saying, what do I really want? Can I be uncomfortable once in a while? Can I pass on that dessert today? Yeah, I don't have it, to have it, it all It makes the time. my brain think, like, I'd have to be really, really, really uncomfortable to take the risk of the, some of these medications that are being touted as no risk. Because they're big, big risks. But again, people are like, I don't know if I have the skill set. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Well, I, I can. I want to eat all the stuff I want. So I think that's where it begins. What do I really want? You said it. You parted it, paired it right in there. It's like, I want to be healthy. Okay. I want to be able to have more performance in my life, whether it's getting up and off the floor, maybe going snow skiing with my grandkids, whatever it is. Or don't you know? You know, a lot of people are having their knees and hips replaced and sometimes that's wear and tear from certain things but a lot of times it, it's the again the symptom of carrying all this excess weight from being so comfortable that now now you're uncomfortable and now we're going to go change that knee out well i and i had a i i was having lunch with an orthopedic surgeon in our town many many years ago and we were talking about you know using our personal training program and using his services and back and forth and physical therapy and I said tell me a little bit about your surgeries on overweight men he said what are you talking about I said well you know tell me about like r knee replacement hip replacement he goes I don't do a whole lot of knee and hip replacements on overweight men because they don't live that long I'm like wow he goes very rarely do I do a 75 80 year old hip replacement knee replacement if they're very large people because they're not they're not living so Again, back to performance and health and all the stuff that comes with it. We know if we're more of our natural body weight, per se, we have a lot less stress on the joints, the heart, the, the blood pressure. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Stroke, dementia. We know that Alzheimer's and all the brain issues are directly related to you know high levels of obesity. So there's all sorts of factors that come in there. But... It really begins with that self-awareness, where you are today, what, what do you want, how do we do this, what's the process, and uh, really understand hormones. You, you talked about dopamine for a minute. Insulin is a hunger hormone. So when you overeat, you overproduce insulin. That's what it does. It comes in. That's how these medications are basically working. It helps to store nutrients. Well, it's a hunger hormone. So that's why when I looked at the sumo wrestlers way back in the day and did my meal patterning book, it was all about how do these sumos gain their weight? Well, they know if they overeat, they overproduce insulin to create more weight gain, and this, that's the goal. That's their, their want. So what if we just did the opposite? What if we could eat smaller meals, not overstimulate insulin? What if we could start using glucagon and le leptin? Leptin's a satisfying hormone. And then ghrelin, what is ghrelin? Well, ghrelin makes you want to overeat. That's lack of sleep. So these hormones are a big deal. So back to your health. What thing. was grueling you think needed for at one point in our existence? It would get you to like if you were starving out in the Yukon, it would it would create motivation for sure to go out and hunt. Yeah, hunt. Like against all odds is So if you're super stressed out, which we think stress is different, but let's just say you got fight or flight going on. Grueling comes out and says, hey, go eat. Go so, eat. So when you hear people say, I'm an emotional stress eater, we were designed that way. But yeah, being stressed out because you got a project due isn't the same as being in the Yukon it's trying to the, survive. It's, it, yeah, it's a difference. So now we're And here's the difference. You're not going to be able to go to the vending machine in the Yukon. No. <laughs> so like this, this grueling was, I mean, it, it allowed us to stay alive. Now... It's still there because we're, we're I mean, humans. Think about the human body. Like lipase, lipase is a fat-storing hormone. So you don't so, freeze to death? Or? So, so, so when you have – if you go – you haven't eaten in a while, the body's going to store. So that's the science kind of behind the sumo wrestlers. They only eat one meal a day. They're really good. Their lipase enzymes are super – a sensitive in the list. They live to on. 35, by the way. Yeah, and they live. They basically d type two diabetes in their 30s, <laughs> and they die by their. That's you know, not funny, but it. it's but my my point is this: is so back to your ghrelin, and think about how ghrelin and leptin work. They're opposing hormones, and so when I'm sleeping and I'm eating the right way, 
leptin comes out to play and it makes us satisfied. And I hear like, oh, I'm a stress eater. Well, yeah, I get that. Or maybe I'm, I, I'm addicted to sugar. Well, yeah, because you're maybe you didn't sleep. You maybe didn't sleep or you're not moving. You know, you go move your body. I'm not hungry. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I chase my natural. Th- my kids are acting like uh, monsters. I tend to want to grab a popsicle in the For sure. fridge. But if you go out and move around, like we were skiing this last Friday, you ski and you're not eating. You're not eating while you're on the slopes. And you're yeah. out there for three or four, five, six hours, whatever. Yeah. So you you'll get hungry, but so leptin and ghrelin are opposing. So now you say, have you ever heard of these hormones? They're like, no. So let's talk about that. So you're not sleeping. We now know if you're not sleeping or you know this and that. These hormones, once you get them more in balance, now I'm not overeating. I'm eating when I should. Again, back to I'm out to sea. The guys in the dinghy fishing in this gigantic storm because it's trumping everything he's got to eat so these hormones are a big deal yeah hormones are i I think that i think that's a good point about the dopamine and the comfortability and so let's talk i I try to write let's try to condense this and go through it fairly quick but i wrote down four things we got to attack stress because if we're talking hormones we got to talk about stress Let's let's put exercise in front of nutrition just for this episode. I think the the part I have a real big problem with Ozempic is it really disincentivizes people to move their body, and we're already not moving our body. And there's mental health things, and and there's one of the side effects no one's talking about with Ozempic is suicidal thoughts, and it go it's going to go on. It, and it on pauses and on. for a second because you said this. So when I'm taking these things, they're blunting everything. It's like a beta blocker. I don't. I can't get my energy up. Well, of course you can't, because your beta blocker's shutting everything down. It's the same thing. You know, your digestive system starts to slow down. Hormones are de- absorptions de- out the window. Yeah. yeah now I'm. Absorption. I mean, we we've both worked with people that have absorption issues. Yes. Very skinny. And they're miserable because they don't have energy. Their skin's a mess. They can't sleep. They can't regulate their you know, diarrhea, the list goes on. So but now, it didn't happen overnight. And so no, the thing with this Ozempic is, okay, let's just say you get to that target weight. What's five years down the road look like? Now all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I don't know. My hair's falling out in patches and my digestion, you know, I can't go to the bathroom or I'm going to the bathroom too much and the doctor's worried about anything well, and everything. And again, I'm kind of going off the beaten path here a couple of times, but you know, I was doing a I was doing a seminar way back in the day at Coeur d'Alene, Lane, Idaho, and one of the questions in the audience is about gallbladders, and I'm like, well, you know, the gallbladder emulsifies fat. It's like back in the day, you take out the tonsils. You don't want to take the gallbladder out. That's the last resort. So there's so many things we've even done podcasts on this, but and you don't want to take out the stomach. And so Ozempic's yes. job is it's to really paralyze stuff. the so everybody stomach. Wake up like, hey, listen, we need that gallbladder. If that gallbladder is taken out, then the pancreas has to work harder. Now I'm going to have type 2 diabetes in the next you know, 5, 8, 10 years later. That's what we're seeing now with this digestive health issues. We have no idea with how that's going to affect our digestion or absorption of nutrients. The list goes on. All right, let's so. talk about stress. I think one of the things always jumped over and hurdled because we live in this stress uh society where it's normal to be just in fight or flight just kind of surviving stress is a big deal when it comes to weight loss or the the lack of managing it is really preventing a lot of people from working with their body versus against it i think it's the number one okay so number one nobody's talking about it there's never going to be a drug for there is a drug for managing symptoms of anxiety and but it's not going after the source again stop just for a second when we have we feel threatened, the fight or flight, you got to ask the question: What hormones come out to play? And these are all your stress hormones: cortisol, aldosterone, epinephrine. The list goes on. If those hormones are out in the, in rampant force, which they are, they're not getting a rest. Then the other side of the equation, called steroidal hormones, which is our sex hormones, go to bed. <laughs> go to bed. They're sleeping. So Glu- now growth Glu- hormones, What is that? Glucocorticoid? What's in the... Uh, yes. Yeah, so now we're getting glucocorticoids. The list goes on and on and on. Well, again, this could be a whole hormone. So stre- stress is connected to the thyroid. Yeah. What's that song? The hip bones connected. Yes. yes. <laughs> so stress, thyroid is the stress gland. Thyroid is responsible for metabolism. And next thing you know, our stress is out to lunch. 
thyroid now is not functioning. And then we say, well, I can't lose weight. Well, I, I, I have, I've had a handful of people in here recently, and they're having problems with digestion, major. And they really are t going after the food. I'm like, wait a minute. Your food is not your problem. Your problem is you don't have any recovery during your day. You're going 900 miles an hour, 18 hours every single day. Until you get this in control, I don't really have a whole lot to share with you. So, and they don't want to do that. Again, self-awareness. Are you really aware? Can you, can you eat your lunch for 10 minutes? Can you go to lunch? By yourself? <laughs> can you eat, take a lunch? A, sitting somewhere without having phones and... Th if you can't do that, then we need to get out of your whatever you're doing. So, so yeah, rest, rest equals we, digest. We've got to get understand that whole stress and rust piece. That's got to be first sleeping, right hormones, breathing, space, schedules, being in nature, quietness, stillness, grounding. Yep. If you don't have that, it's going to be really hard to lose weight. We'll, we'll go deeper on stress, but that is a. That's everything. That is, I mean, let's just call, let's just call it fifty percent. It doesn't. I'm not being literal, but let's just say fifty percent equation of stress. Nobody wants to talk about it because nobody wants to slow it down, and we want to continue to chase. There's so much that can come with managing stress, and one of the symptoms that can be really improved is metabolism, energy, health, which then your weight starts to be easier. Again, these symptoms back to creating a process. Okay, exercise. People think I gotta I gotta exercise to lose weight, and then there's a lot of people who say I don't want to exercise, but I want to lose weight. Reframe exercise for people, and why this is not just for weight, but it it also is critical piece of having a again back optimal to first, weight. First thing you said, what do I want? I want to lose weight. Okay, do you want to be healthy? Do you want to lose weight and not be healthy? That's a question I ask my clients. Do you want to be lose weight and be healthy? Because if you want to lose weight and, and not be healthy, then you're in the wrong building. So let's just you can go, you can leave because I'm not going to help you in that, that direction. What I will help you to do is understanding that when you create this, you know, this process along the way, can you be healthy and lose weight? And so a big part of that is, are, are you aware of that? And so back to the exercise pieces the exercise creates optimal brain health so again motion creates positive emotion you create a bigger engine you gotta ask the question where does my energy come from it comes from the mitochondria what's the mitochondria do it's a big part of my metabolism do you want metabolism metabolism be sluggish and for every stinking calorie you, you put in your body your body doesn't have ability to burn it no or would you rather burn more fuel naturally that's where movement comes in. And then all the other benefits that come with it, with your heart, your lungs, your digestive system. I mean, when dog, you know, when Boji and Floyd eat and they go for a walk, it's going to create, you know, digestive, you know, consistency. So that's where you got to get your arms wrapped around. You do never want to lose weight. You never want to lose muscle as you age. So here's a good rule of thumb. If you're losing weight and you're not exercising, you might you you really might want to stop because it's it's setting you up for failure. It, it's Absolutely. going to, um, you're going about it the wrong way. If if what you're looking for is to be healthy, and again, a lot of people cannot be overweight; they can be over fat. And so, a big part of this is you age, especially. You know, I tell all my clients, once that's you not a negative. That's not making no. fun of someone. It's just too it's much true. body fat. Too much body. They're not overweight. They just don't have a big enough engine. So again. I'm going to challenge you. Can you do a hang? Can you get up and off the floor? Can you do a step up? Can you do a push up? Can you do these things that tells me right away that you have that muscle strength? And so if I don't create that awareness, hey, I'm just losing weight. Well, you're losing muscle. We don't want to lose muscle as you age. You want to maintain your muscle or improve your muscle as you age. So that's a big deal with movement. Movement is the brain. It's the digestive. It's the hormones. It's everything that comes with that. It's the and strength. It's the function. It's the capacity, right, too. Right, capacity. And again, back to creating a bigger engine. All right, let's talk about art and science of dieting. This is, to me, w what is unique about us. There is a science to losing weight, calories in, calories out, which there's a lot to debunk there. But there's also an art. You know, what do you like? What do you not like? How are you going to do it? Do you... What's your lifestyle look like? What's your work schedule? Let's talk about art and science. So, again, when you, 
go to kind of the extreme, which is in bodybuilding, you have these, you know, you start learning. It's all about the emotions and behavior and whatever. And so that's why diets work until they don't because you don't understand the art of it. You're just following the science of it. Like eat this protein, eat this fat, don't eat these carbs, do exercise or whatever it is. So the art is like number one is recognizing it's go time. You have to decide. So if you said, hey, I'm listening to this podcast today, I want to lose weight, then decide. I'm not going to waffle. I'm deciding that now is the time. It's go time. As you just mentioned, number two is what do you want? Get really specific of what you want. I would like to lose 10 pounds. Okay, I got that. Number two, I need to make sure I'm getting seven or eight hours of sleep. I need to drink this much water. You got to think about all that stuff that comes with it. Or I want to I want to. I want to water ski. I want to water ski. I want to, I want to ski with my grandkids. I want to hang from that bar. Whatever it is, let's get into that because that's what we do. And then from there, I'm going to go back in time. Give me a little history here. What have you done in the past? Where do you get, where's your challenges? Where's your roadblocks? What's, what's, what's your holding environment? You back? What's your environment look like? What's your environment look like? What are your beliefs? So beliefs is a big deal. Again, I, can you do it or you can't do it? Do you truly believe you can lose weight and be healthy? I got to tell you, many people don't believe they can lose weight and be healthy. And then from there, we get into 80-20 rule. You're developing a lifestyle. 80% of the time, you're doing a, you know, you're dialed in. You're very intentional. 20% of the time, you're letting your hair down. It's not rigid, but it's a plan. And again, if you're starting to, I want to get more results quicker. It's no different than, it's I'm going to do a 90-10 program or I'm going to dial in. And then from there, as you mentioned, I'm going to build support systems around me, my environment, my friends, my family. Because, if again, if you're going out to the bar and you're trying not to drink, oh, okay, how's that going to work? Or then I start planning, b building habits. So this is all, and then monitoring, your. this is all the art of losing weight. Yeah, there, but the art of just living, this art the just art, living. Uh, the art of eating, the art of exercise, it's, it doesn't have to be this. You don't have to lead with the science because the truth is some of the smartest people that know the science have no idea the art. They don't know how to do it. So how to do it's one thing. Doing it is another thing. And doing it that it's your plan. Yeah. That's the key. That's what we've been trying well, to teach I'll forever. I'll give you an example. So there's a lot of noise that, like, I, I sent you this video, and this lady makes smoothies, but she f did a genetic allergy test, and she can't have bananas. So now her smoothie can't have bananas. But now then she's putting the uh, protein peptides in there and all this other junk. Here's the, here's the deal. We got to start paying attention that, the things that catch our attention are always going to be the extremes. So you're going to say, well, this is so unhealthy. Yeah, that seems like so extreme. But like no one's really eating that every day. No one's having a, a deep fried Snickers bar. You know, it catches our attention. What we're having is these slow drips, you know, the crackers and the chips and the going through the fast food. That's normal and it doesn't grab our attention. And then the extremes when someone says a banana is unhealthy. Or you can't have oatmeal because it's got these properties or yeah, you, you the sent, oxalates with the... Yeah, you sent that to me yesterday, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to name any names. But, you know, very popular you know, doctor out there. You send that to me, that, that gets my blood to boil. Well, they're just making up... It's just crap. They're taking scientific terms, blending it with what people think are healthy, and then now people are confused. It's like eggs are bad, now eggs are good. Right. Cholesterol is bad, cholesterol is good. So here's the thing. I always think the art is more important, but why don't you just go into a little bit of the science here? So the science really gets back to the cell. So the, our three principles, cellular health, pH balance, and the source. So can you say yes to all three? So the cell, that's why a, a calories, I mean, we'll talk about calories in just a second. Calories are really important, but calories do not equal a calorie because of the cell. So 100 calories of broccoli, the cell doesn't look at it as 100 calories of chocolate cake. And that's why a calorie in and a calorie out is not the foolproof system. To yeah, lose because weight. again, back to stress levels, back to genetics, back to how much muscle you have, the mitochondria, back to the cell. So 
That's step number one is understanding the cell. Is my cell healthy? Type 2 diabetes. As the cell gets healthier, your A1C falls. So again, it's back to omega-3 fats, all sorts of things. So cellular health, getting your pH imbalance, because again, if my body's too acidic, I'm going to leach out minerals. Yes, I will lose weight short term, but now I'm going to have problems because I'm you know, deficient. Yeah, so I've lost weight. Maybe I'm down 25 pounds, but the doctor says your calcium is low, your potassium is low, your electrolytes, and now you're going to get supplementation and you don't want to I mean, go you showed me the guy. What was the guy that had 111? Yeah, Brian Johnson, this goofball. 100, 100, what? what, 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 what? <laughs> 100 and, 111 yeah. pills a yeah, day. Yeah, Brian, come and talk to me in 20 years, <laughs> see how that's going for you. So the second Four, one is. You asked me his age. He's 42. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> um, the second piece is is understanding a little bit about hormones. And I don't need to get deep with my clients about this, but I want to talk to them a little bit about like the stress hormones, the building hormones. Your, your, we talked about ghrelin. We talk about leptin, lipase enzymes. How does the body actually work? Let's give a little example of that. So when the hormones are working with you, now I'm going down the hill versus if the hormones are working against you, now I'm moving up the hill. So again, that's why we talked about stress at the very beginning. And then from there, it's a lot of it has to do with what are your patterns of eating? I always sit down like, hey, tell me how you eat. And they're like, what are you talking about? When you, when's your first meal? How often do you eat during the day? Do you go six hours, 10 hours, three hours? What does that look like? Is it a variable? Is it, is it consistent? Variable? Is it a consistency? You know, are when you do you have a bowel when you eat? Yeah, well, all that stuff. So I now I get a, hab, a, a, a plan of their meal patterns when do they fast? Are they fasting, not fasting, whatever? And then um, we get into awareness. And this is now we get into serving sizes, how many calories you consume, what nutrients are you missing? But you can see this. There's a lot here. But you don't have to, like you said, let's go to the basics. Let's decide. Let's focus on what I want. Let's get really on the art side. And then on the science side, it's like, okay. I want my body working for me. What do I need to do? Well, that's why we need to exercise. We need to move. We need to change your patterns of your eating. We need to understand why breathing is so important to help your hormones and then understanding how do you get your cells healthy. That I think you I think you wrote your books um, backwards. I think I think meal patterning would be a very relevant topic today because we've made it so confusing. Like meal patterning is a very simple approach to and then rest, eat, move. Imagine if you wrote rest, eat, move 30 years ago. People would be like, wait, we don't just count calories. And so it's it's an interesting time. As, and, that, and that's why. Because as, as you were just talking, one of the things that I, I, you know, you have these feelings, you just realize, like, the only reason why there's all these different layers is because we're trying to run a fast-paced life with easy and not getting uncomfortable. Because if you are uncomfortable, you know, like you're watching the, the Yellowstones or the 18, what is it, 1889 or 83, nobody's overweight. You know, you're going from one town to the next and you're cooking it and you're picking it and you're hunting it and you're on a horse and you're doing physical labor. And so you think, well, why is it so complex? It really isn't complex. Well, What's complex is our yeah. lifestyle and trying to have both. It's it, it, again beginning of this podcast. It's so easy. You said this a long. I've heard that you say this many times. It's okay to have something that's hard. That's what that whole comfort crisis is. Let's do a few things that are a little bit uncomfortable. When we went to Colorado skiing two weeks ago, hardly anybody's overweight skiing, especially kind of the you know. Form follows function. And then we get on the we, – we fly from Aspen to Denver, Denver to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the flight from Denver to Grand Rapids, uh, you, you're like, where do these people come from? And then you're sitting in there, and they're bringing in their own sodas. They're bringing in their Cheetos. They're bringing in their candy bars. And I'm like, wow, this is – again, you – we're aware of this. We're around it our whole lives. But it just hits you like – in environment, I mean, it's like trading places. It's all about what do you, what's your day in and day out habits. And if we didn't, if you didn't drive, like you said, if you were in the Yukon, this would disappear in two seconds. But we're not saying you need to be in the Yukon. 
We just need to say, hey, let's get yeah, a little and, and I think the ketogenic diet is a great example. If you did that naturally, like you just went into the woods and got in a more ketogenic state because you're in a starvation state, you lose weight, you'll be cognitively more, but you don't have to work and you're not worried about making the money and like taking care of your kids. You're surviving. In a short period of time, the body does amazing things that adapts, but you don't want to do that long term. I mean, we saw what the cavemen, what do they live to 30 years old? Yeah. You, can't, you don't want to follow that lifestyle to try to live to 90. It doesn't match up. But we have to realize we're very comfortable, and yet we want these solutions that don't get us any more uncomfortable but give us results. It, it's a backwards thing. It's like I want to be rich, but I don't want to put in any effort. And, and we know now, I mean, whether you win the lottery or whatever, but – if you could go back in time, I that's say not this, happiness. I, I tell people all the time in your business, like when we're talking to different businesses, I said if you could be where you are right today, but you didn't have to go through any of the effort or the more uncomfortableness, would you take that? Nobody wants that. They they look back and go, I really I really appreciate what I have now. I really appreciate my health. I really appreciate you know. I was talking to this guy last night on the phone away home. And as his dad, kind of the end of life, and he said to me, it really hit me, he said, Dad, is there anything I could get you? He goes, you know what, what I really would like is to have a one more family dinner. That's what he wanted. It wasn't more money. It wasn't this or that. It was like, I want one more family dinner. So that's what we have to say to ourselves, that our greatest asset is always going to be our health. And if, 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 we, if that is the case, that that's what we want, but I want to lose some weight, I, I tell people, you could, I could take a group to the mountains of Colorado this is just perfect. That this, exercise, this, yeah. this is just a symptom. Medications go away. They need to go away. All right, let's let's wrap up weight. with portion control because you wanted to hit that um, again. Back to your comfort crisis and portion control, and we don't talk about calories a lot because, again, there's usually five steps before we talk about calories. But portion control matters, and it's off the rails in our country. If you really had to count everything that went in your mouth, you would be shocked, including myself, that I, I didn't, I wasn't that aware of that. So back in the day, you know, we have the oatmeal and run, but I was thinking, you know, gosh, you know, I'm eating this oatmeal and run, and I'm kind of not getting as lean as I want to be. Well, I actually measured it. And one time it was close to a thousand calories for my breakfast. I had a guy in, in, in this, he was, you know, tr training with me and I was talking about the benefits of macadamia nuts, and the next thing you know, he goes, you know, in the last month or so, I've gained, a, I've gained some weight. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, well, I'm, eat, I'm doing exactly what you said. I said, well, how much, how much, what are you doing? He said, I eat these macadamia nuts every night. Well, how much do you consume? Oh, usually a quarter to half a cup. What? You're consuming five, six, seven hundred calories every night. Just, we're not aware of that. So we need to be aware, and maybe you could track this for a day or two. We're not a big fan of counting calories or macros. But we want to have that awareness, like, what is in that? How much are you actually eating? And I was playing around with this last week. I was like, okay, I ate an apple, and I ate three Brazil nuts. Well, that was 250 calories for three Brazil nuts and an apple. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of calories for an apple and a Brazil nuts. And then I ate my oatmeal. My oatmeal was almost 450 calories plus my cod liver oil, which is another 100 calories. So I come out of the shoot, and I'm like 400, 500 calories right away. Here's my apple, and I'm thinking, that's nothing. But, again, it is something. So I think that's an awareness tool we, we all need to be paying <laughs> yeah, attention to. Yeah, I mean, to. it's like uh, I think of, like, pistachio nut. A couple of things. I lo love pistachio nuts. The kids love pistachio nuts. But when I was a kid, pistachio nuts only came out at Christmas. It was like a nice, fancy thing. When they came in the, where you actually had to shell them. Okay, so that's where I'm going. I still only buy the shell. I think they taste better, but now you don't even have to shell them. And how fast can you eat a pistachio nut? Or you go, you think back when you used to have the nuts that you had to crack, and like how many Brazil nuts would you crack before you're like, I'm done? done. Not that many. But if they're already cracked and everything is pra packaged and prepared, it's like anything. I think the more easy it is, and I think the, the food manufacturer's job is to make it so you want to consume it. So everybody's working together to make it everything so much easier and less uncomfortable. And food is designed, though, to eat slowly and kind of have some work. Um, and so, you know, you talk about m measuring or ma paying attention. Back to your statement. 
gentleman doesn't have time to eat lunch. You're never going to have the awareness of what goes in your mouth then because you're multitasking and, and you can shove a fork to your mouth. The next thing you know, the whole plate is gone. But if you sat down, got rid of all electronics, even don't even read anything, just kind of be there and consume food like we were kind of designed to do. And you did it slowly and you chewed, you start to like pay attention and you're communicating and here's a great exercise what you're saying to this and again i'm guilty of this oh yeah you're guilty of it i've seen you oh yeah shove oh for sure raise it raisins and oatmeal you've never seen someone eat more raisins and oatmeal so i think we all could take this exercise sit down for dinner or lunch or whatever meal you're eating and actually take the spoon again just do it one time consume the food chew the food put the fork or spoon down and then repeat it and just create this awareness of how long this takes and what it does and what the stillness that it provides. I mean, there's a lot, there's a huge benefit to that. It's about, I think the science, again, it's not all science, but about 20 minutes from when you start to eat to where your, your body actually starts to register. Oh, I'm full. So if, if you're a just absolute crusher, yeah, just a wolf, Next thing you know, you're now bloated and overextended because you just never paid attention. So the slower that process is, you tend to eat less, you absorb it and digest it better. You know, one of the exercises I really love, and uh, my wife, Holly, always jokes, like, if she can just get a hot meal, but by the time the kids are fed and sits down and you're up and down and up and down, it then gets cold. But you're getting ready to eat. You're looking at the food in front of you. You take take the fork and you just hold it there for a second and watch what happens to your saliva. You start to get ready to consume v- food versus just starting to shove it down on the go. You know, you have this here saliva. Comes the, here comes the diet soda. Yeah, and it's so. washing mm-hmm. down all this these enzymes. And so what we're getting at today, I don't like to use this word often, but weight loss is actually pretty, I'm going to say simple, but it's, in our society, it's pretty easy if you follow the process. Being uncomfortable, though, is not easy. And so those are where we're, we're kind of disconnected. We're, we're, we're wanting to run to 17 soccer practices and meetings and on Facebook and scroll on social media and texting 15 times and got to get dinner and go to the grocery store. And then at the same time, we want to be healthy. They just don't work together. Now, you may see someone that you think can do all those things and they look thin, but health is much more than what someone looks like and how much they weigh and mental health, physical health, capacity, function, can you sleep, what the blood work says. And so that's the point today. Weight loss is big. You know, we've spent 52 minutes today talking and we probably could go another eight. Let me just say one more thing here. So, again, lots of information, as you said. It might be simple, simple, but it's not easy. So I want to make that really clear to everybody. It's, it's, it's very challenging. But if you can really build one or two habits and build this process, for example, you know, how much, how much do you eat? Make this simple as we wrap this up. Number one is, you know, we talked about what do you want and all this. But what is your typical routine? Look at your typical routine. That would be number two. What does your sleep look like? What does your stress look like? What is your daily weight? How much do you weigh once a week or whatever you're doing? Are you moving your body? So it it gets back to that simplicity. It's not easy to do. And and again, next time I'm eating, am I eating for, is it real hunger or is it reward hunger? And most of the time during the day, I would probably guesstimate that it's reward hunger. So really start paying attention to that. Which isn't a problem. I mean, if you want a reward with eating and cooking and all that. We, but if, we, if we, it's the 100% barometer. And then having the mindfulness that, you know, Kristen talks a lot about that, but having the mindfulness of around just being aware that it, next time I catch myself, it's okay to be reward myself, but is that w- what I'm doing most of the time? All right, so as we wrap up, my takeaway is why don't you just focus on trying to be healthy and the symptom of weight loss will come. There's an art, there's a science, there's a process, um, and we're here to help. We'll see you again next time.